Hello, my name is Drew Fustini. Uh, the Embedded Linux Conference North America and Europe are always a highlight for me every year. It's too bad we can't be together in Dublin, but I'm excited to be a part of it virtually. So I wanted to talk to you today about two of my favorite things, which are Linux and open source hardware, and how RISC-V plays into that. I'm an open source hardware designer at a PCB manufacturing service in the US. I'm also on the board of directors of the Beagle Border Drug Foundation. You might be familiar with the BeagleBone, which is a small open source hardware Linux computer. I'm also on the board of directors of the Open Source Hardware Association, or OSHWA. We have an open source hardware certification program that you can take part in. I'm also a RISC-V ambassador for RISC-V International, and I'll talk a little bit more about that organization later. There's RISC-V virtual meetups all around the world, including Munich and Bay Area. And while they're not in person right now, you can find ones that are in your time zone at risk5.org. And coming up in December is the big annual event uh, for RISC-V called the RISC-V Summit, which will be happening December 8th through 10th. I moved to Berlin, well, I'm from Chicago, but I moved to Berlin um, last year and I started the Berlin Embedded Linux Meetup along with Lucas Hartman. Uh, if you're interested, join the group. We're not re meeting right now, but when we're able to, we'll, we'll start meeting again, hopefully. And a really cool project that Lucas has been working on for several years now is the Reform Laptop, and it's finally shipping. It's a completely open source from the mechanical to the electronics to the software laptop. So what is open source hardware? So it's hardware whose design is made publicly available so that anyone can study, modify, distribute, make, and sell the design or hardware based on that design. So in the context of electronics, this means the schematics and the board layout are shared under an open source license. And this would be the editable source files. So if you're using KiCad or you're using Eagle, it would be the files from that program, not just an output format. And also the bill of materials or parts list. And it's not a requirement, but the best practice is to uh, use components that are available from distributors in low quantities. Um, I've also been asked, you have to use an open source CAT tool. And it's not a requirement, um, but it is the best practice because the idea here behind open source hardware is you're trying to enable collaborative development. Um, so lowering the bar to entry um, so that you don't need, uh, you can get parts in low quantity and you can use open source software to edit the designs. So that's going to um, increase the number of people that can participate in the project. I talk more about open source hardware and in certain aspects like licensing uh, during this talk last December and you can watch the video. So I wanted to talk about RISC-V today and it's an instruction set or an ISA. This is the interface between hardware and software. So for example, you have a C++, a C++ program and it gets compiled into instructions for your processor to execute. But how does the compiler know what instructions the CPU understands? This is defined by the instruction set architecture. So the ISA is a standard. It's a set of rules to define the task that the processor can perform. Um, but proprietary ISAs like x86 and ARM, they require licensing. So you can't just use them. So RISC-V is a free and open source instruction set. It was started about 10 years ago at UC Berkeley by a group of computer researchers led by Kurt Dasanovich. He gives a talk called the RISC-V State of the Union a couple times a year. So that link is to the latest one. So you might wonder what is RISC? So RISC stands for a reduced instruction set computer. So this goes back to a um, new concept in computer architecture from the early 80s and it's become quite dominant. For example, ARM is a RISC, RISC, RISC instruction set. Uh, and then you might wonder why the V or the 5. So that's because this is the fifth instruction set to come out of UC Berkeley. But why do I say it's free and open? This is because the RISC-V specifications are licensed under the Creative Commons attribution license. So what's different about RISC-V? Because there's a lot of instruction sets out there. So the idea behind RISC-V was they wanted to start with a clean slate, given all their experience from the previous generations of RISC instruction sets that they had helped to find. And the idea was to make it simple. 
and far smaller than other commercial ISAs like Intel or, or ARMv8 and have a clear separation between unprivileged, which is like the bare metal code, and privileged ISAs, which is you know what you'd be using for running a full operating system. Another key concept was separating the specification from the implementation. So not having microarchitecture be part of the instruction set so that you'd be free to implement it how you see best fit. It's also a modular ISA that's designed to be extensible and be able to be specialized. So there's a small standard base with multiple standard extensions, which makes it suitable for everything from a tiny microcontroller to a big, powerful supercomputer. But it's also stable because the base and standard extensions are frozen and then additions are made via optional extensions but it's not a new version of the base ISA underneath it. So there's four base integer instruction sets, uh, the first of which is uh, RV32i, which is 32-bit. Then it's less than 50 instructions. Uh, you can look there, and if you looked at x86 or maybe v 8 this is much, much smaller. There's also an embedded variant that has smaller number of registers um, to save on resources. Uh, but probably the more common one will be RV64i, which is 64-bit integer. There's even 128-bit, which might seem a little silly, um, but experience has uh, the, the experience of the designers were that you can you can never have enough address space. That that's the thing that if you run an address space, it's really hard to work around that. And with non-volatile RAM capacities increasing, we may need that sooner rather than later. It's also beneficial for security reasons as well to have a large address space. So the RISC-V base is, gets added these standard extensions. Um, so for example, there's M, which is multiply divide, A for atomic, which is useful if you have a multiprocessor system, and then you have different precisions of floating point, F, D, and Q, and then G is for general purpose. So this is shorthand for integer, multiply, atomic, flow in double precision flow. And then C is for compressed instruction encoding. And this helps conserve memory in cache and similar to, you might be familiar with arm thumb. And then there's also additional extensions um, that are being worked on such as vector processing. But these won't require a new base version of the ISA. And then more practical for my interests, Linux distros like Debian and Fedora are targeting specifically RV64 GC. So those that's the base ISA and the standard extensions that Linux distros are targeting. And the base and the standard extensions, these were frozen in 2014 and then they were ratified in 2019. So if you were to compile a program right now for RV64 GC, you know, in 20 years from now on some giant RISC V fancy processor, it'll still be able to run. So to give you a sense of the, the landscape of the base ISA and the standard extensions, this is all the instructions on one card. And if you compare that to x86 or v 8 um, I would say it's much smaller. If you want to get more in depth in the instruction set, I recommend the RISC-V Reader. It's a pretty short book, about 100 pages, and it gets you up to speed really quick. It's also available in several different languages. So RISC-V is seeing increasing adoption in industry. RISC-V International now controls the specifications at uh, RISC-V.org. Um, they took over from the original group at Berkeley. It's a nonprofit organization, it keeps on growing. There's last, last I looked, there were 690 members. It's probably past 700 by now um, from 50 different countries. And this includes companies and universities and nonprofits. Um, and you can, as an individual, join yourself. And it's free for individuals to join. It's free for nonprofits and universities to join. And one of the great things is the RISC V International has a YouTube channel with hundreds of talks from the last several years. And one of the ways I've learned a lot about RISC V is by watching those talks. So I highly recommend checking it out. <clears throat> one of the things that's quite exciting is that companies plan to ship billions of devices with RISC V cores. NVIDIA is already shipping RISC-V cores for system management tasks in its GPU products. And Western Digital, a couple years ago, announced that they were going to replace 
all the controllers in their storage project storage products with risk v uh, and, and one of the reasons that they're doing this is to allow them to innovate in the microarchitecture. Like they have a core now um, that they're going to be using that has two hardware threads and a power efficient microcontroller. Another reason companies might be interested in RISC-V is to avoid ISA licensing fees and royalty fees, um, including the legal costs, and then also to avoid the long delays that can come about with these complex licensing agreements. So it's not usually where you just go and download something. It's usually a rather long process to actually license the core and get in and start designing with it. RISC-V also gives companies freedom to choose the microarchitecture implementation. So one thing to keep in mind is that only a few companies like Apple, Samsung, and Qualcomm have ARM architecture licenses that allows them to do their own custom implementations of the instruction set. Everyone else is just licensing cores, and that doesn't give as much room to be able to differentiate um, their processor from other companies that are licensing the same core. Companies also have the freedom to leverage existing open source implementations. So since the instruction set is open, um, there's several open source implementations, um, such as Rocket and Boom out of Berkeley. ETH Zurich has the Pulp team, and they have several popular cores like Risky and Ariane, and Western Digital has their Swerve cores, one of which is that microcontroller with uh, two hardware threads, which is quite innovative. But one of the really important things when it comes to um, instruction sets, and one of the reasons why Intel has maintained such dominance with x86, is the software. And RISC-V is doing really well in that regard. Uh, there's already critical mass for software support um, with RISC-V. So Linux and BSD and GCC and glibc and Clang all support RISC-V. Um, Real-time operating systems like FreeRTOS and Zephyr support RISC-V. And QEMU supports emulating RISC-V as well. That link there that says well-supported software, that will take you to a GitHub um, repo where RISC-V Foundation keeps, or RISC-V International now, keeps a list of um, the current state for all the different languages and all the different libraries and operating systems with regards to RISC-V. And back at the Embedded Linux Conference North America in June, um, Cam gave a great talk about the state of software development tools, so I recommend checking that out as well. So RISC-V International is based in Switzerland. Before that, there was the US-based RISC-V Foundation. And at the beginning of this year, they reincorporated in Switzerland. And this was to avoid any political issues since um, many of the members are outside of the US. So with Switzerland, they won't have to worry about those sorts of issues. Um, and RISC-V has also become very interesting at the national level. So organizations like the European Union and nations like India and Pakistan have national initiatives to do RISC-V processor designs. And this is driven by the desire to have sovereignty over technology and also be able to avoid backdoors from other nations. There's also strong interest from chip makers in China. So US companies were banned in 2019 from doing business with Huawei. So you have, to, you have to think that other Chinese companies are probably wondering who is going to be next in terms of these restrictions. Thankfully for Huawei, ARM is deemed to be a UK origin technology. So it was okay to do business with Huawei, but you know how long will that last? And how will the NVIDIA acquisition impact all this? So that in uncertainty is really driving more and more companies to look at RISC-V as a way to uh, reduce the uncertainty when it comes to their ability to have their technology roadmaps go forward. <clears throat> so sometimes I hear people ask, uh, is, is RISC-V an open source processor or an open source CPU? And that's not quite right. So RISC-V is a, just a set of specifications under an open license. So the RISC-V implementations can be either open source or proprietary. Um, 
but open specifications make open source implementations possible. So we can't have an open source processor for a proprietary ISA like x86 or ARM. So RISC V being open makes it possible for us to have open source processors. The RISC V privilege architecture has three different modes. So there's the machine mode or M mode, which is kind of the bare metal, which is where you have the bootloader or firmware. Then there is supervisor mode or S mode. That's where the OS kernel like Linux would be running. And then finally there's user mode or U mode where the applications run. Then there's support for different combinations of these. So M would be just your simple embedded system that's running bare metal. M and U would be an embedded system with memory protection that probably be running an RTOS. And then M, S, and U together would give us an Unix style operating system with virtual memory. And there's also a hypervisor extension in draft and that would give us a modified S mode called HS. So the RISC-V boot, boot flow is similar to probably what you've seen with uh, architecture like ARM. Uh, where you have the zero stage bootloader in the SOC ROM and then you might have a small first stage bootloader that eventually then goes into U-Boot as the final stage bootloader that jumps into Linux. But something you might not be familiar with on this diagram is OpenSBI. So SBI stands for Supervisor Binary Interface and this is something that's specific to RISC-V. It's the calling convention between the supervisor or S mode OS um, so like the Linux kernel and the supervisor execution environment which would be the bare metal code in M mode. And this allows the supervisor mode software to be written so that it's portable to all different RISC-V implementations. So the, the RISC-V architecture support in the Linux kernel isn't tied to specific RISC-V implementations. It's abstracted away by SPI. Uh, SPI came out of the Unix class platform spec working group which is now chaired by Ale Stone of Red Hat. Um, there's uh, frequent meetings, so if you do join RISC-V International as a member and you can do that free of cost, then you can start participating in these meetings and, and joining the mailing list and, and keeping up with what's going on. It's now transitioning to something called RISC-V Profiles and Platform to be more, more generic than, than being specifically about Unix. So OpenSBI is the open source implementation of SBI. And it, the idea here is to be the de facto implementations. We avoid the fragmentation of different SBI implementations. So SBI is the specification, and then open SBI is the code that actually implements that specification. And the way that it can hopefully avoid fragmentation is by, by providing different layers of implementation. So at its core, it's just a library for SBI, the standard. And then on top of that, there's platform-specific libraries for different SOCs. And then there's also a full platform-specific firmwares. Um, so by using this layered approach, it can be adapted um, for whatever works best for the vendor. OpenSBI provides runtime in M mode, so it's running in that machine mode. And it's typically used in boot stage following the ROM loader. It provides support for reference platforms and also has generic simple drivers um, for M mode to operate. And something that's very common in the x86 world and is becoming increasingly common in the ARM world, especially like ARM V8 for 64 bit ARM, is UEFI. And UEFI is now supported in the RISC V world. So the last piece was having UEFI support in RISC V. And that has landed in 5.10, which should be released by the end of the year. There's already support in Grub and U-Boot for UEFI on RISC-V. And there's also a RISC-V EDK2 port that's now upstream in Tiano Core. So in short, all the things that you need for RISC-V and UEFI to go together are, all, are there now. RISC-V also has full emulation in QEMU. It's in mainline uh, and it can boot both 64-bit and 32-bit Linux kernels. QMU can run OpenSBI, U-Boot, and Core Boot on RISC V. It also supports draft versions of the hypervisor and vector extensions.
And the QEMU Sci Fi machine can boot the same binaries as the physical Sci Fi board, which I'll talk about in a few minutes here. There's a tutorial that you can go through about how to run both the 64 bit and 32 bit RISC V uh, Linux environment under QEMU. So the RISC V was ported to the Linux kernel was ported to RISC V by Palmer, and that landed back in 415. The development's all done on the RISC V uh, mailing list, and you can also so you can join that, and then you can also check out the archive as well on Lore. Uh, a great talk earlier this year at the Munich RISC V meetup from Bjorn Topol um, talked about what's missing currently in RISC V Linux and what you can do to help. And he made the point that um, because it's a newer uh, port, um, it's a great way to learn the nitty gritty details of the Linux kernel. And it's a fun, friendly, and it's still pretty small community compared to how large li the Linux development community is as a whole. And he generated these graphs just to kind of show a comparison here between ARM64, ARC64 slash ARMv8 and RISC-V. RISC um, so you can see RISC-V starting here in 4.14. Um, it's, it's far below the number of commits for ARM64. But when we adjust the beginnings, we can see that um, it's maybe keeping pace with ARM64 if we get more people interested and more people helping to develop it. And Bjorn had a nice list here of you can run this script in the Linux kernel source directory and you can see all the kernel architecture features that are still missing or to do for RISC-V. So some of the recent and ongoing work for, RISC, for the RISC-V port of the Linux kernel. Um, KVM is actually um, pretty much all done now by Anoop and Atish from Western Digital. It's really just waiting on ratification of that hypervisor spec um, in RISC-V uh, ISA. Uh, there's the EBP, EBPF JIT, and everyone loves EBPF these days. Um, there's also GDB support, um, KExec, KDump, KProbes, and KREP probes for Ftrace, um, which I become a big fan of. Um, I highly recommend that if, if you've not tried that out yet. Um, it's very useful, not, not just for RISC V, but just in general, so you don't spend all day having to add in print case to when you're trying to troubleshoot things. Um, generic VDSO support, um, syscaller support for fuzzing, and then also being able to build with, with Clang instead of GCC. So we talked about the Linux kernel, but what about Linux distros? So Fedora um, has a project called Risk Fedora Risk 5, which is a port of um, Fedora to Risk 5. And the aim here is to provide the full Fedora experience. And they've been working on this for several years by now. So one of the ways, and they the one of the ways that they do this is by uh, providing Fedora images that can be boot, can be booted on QEMU if you don't have any hardware. There's also this board called the Sci Five Unleash board, and there's a few of them. They're kind of rare, and I'll be talking more about it in a bit. But that's another way that they run it on on it. So for Fedora, they're using both a mix of um, virtualization on powerful like x86 servers and then a limited number of these um, kind of expensive pieces of hardware. And there's installation instructions for how you can run through and boot up Fedora RISC-V under QEMU, so like on your laptop or your desktop PC. Debian's also been working on a port. Um, so Debian has a port. And for Debian, a port means that uh, it can run the huge Debian archive, which is like 20,000 packages. I, the goal here is to be able to install and run all those packages. And this is a graph that comes off the Debian ports website. And that gray line near the top there is RISC-5. So it's about 95% of those 20,000 packages are now building for RISC-V, which is, a, I think, a great sign. And if you don't need a full Linux distro, there's support in Open Embedded in Yocto project with Meta RISC-V, which I think is uh, Camraj helps out a lot with that. There's also BuildRoot. Um, so the support is now in the upstream BuildRoot project for RISC-V. And if you want to try it out a bit, um, Michael from Bootlin has a great embedded Linux from scratch in 40 minutes on RISC-V tutorial that takes you through the process. So we talked a lot about the software and how we can emulate stuff in, in QEMU, but like we like hardware, right? So like, what are the actual chips out there? So Sci-5 is a startup founded by members of the Berkeley RISC-V team. 
Uh, and then back in 2018, they debuted the FU540. So it was the first RISC V SOC or system on chip that could run Linux. So this had four 64 bit cores that were running up to 1.5 gigahertz and also one simpler low power core for system management tasks. It has 64 bit DDR4 interface and then some peripherals like gigabit ethernet. Unfortunately, not USB though. And then also in 2018, the Sci-Fi Freedom Unleashed board launched. So this was the first Linux-capable RISC-V dev board. Um, they actually ha were showing it off at ELC North America when it, when it came out, and we were all very excited about it. Um, the board design itself is open source hardware, which is nice. Um, it was the highest performance uh, available yet. Um, so the, the SOC is clocked at probably 10 times faster or more than um, FPGA soft cores, so significantly more performance than, than was possible previously. However, it was pretty expensive. It would cost $1,000 and unfortunately it's no longer available. And the chip itself, the SOC from Sci-5 was never sold separately. Um, but the reason for that is Sci-5's core business is designing cores and licensing cores. Um, they're not in the business necessarily of, of, make, of selling SOCs or selling dev boards. Um, that's more something that their customers do. Um, and a little bit of point of clarification here, um, the term ASIC is often used to refer to an SOC that has a hard processor core that's constructed with traditional silicon fabrication. This differentiates from soft core, uh, which, you'd, which you'd have an FPGA, and these, due to their nature, run at significantly slower clock speeds. So when we say ASIC, we mean like a core that's running like quite fast as compared to like a soft core and an FPGA. And you can actually, if you have the necessary hardware, though it's kind of rare and expensive, you can uh, boot the Fedora GNOME image on this Unleash board with an expansion board and graphics card and you get a full Linux desktop. So it's a full Linux graphical desktop on RISC-V, which is pretty neat. Um, but for now, it's, it's a rather expensive hardware setup. But I think the key there is we now know that it works and we know as the hardware continues to become more available, you'll be able to do this sort of functionality. So one of Sci-Fi's customers is Microchip and they designed a SOC similar to the Sci-Fi U540, but they also added an FPGA fabric, uh, which is quite, quite interesting. So that gives you a lot more options in terms of hardware design. Uh, it has DDR3 and DDR4 interfaces. It has PCIe Gen 2 also USB, which is nice, and then two gigabit ethernets. Uh, and this is a full commercial product family from Microchip um, that's gonna be, that's available right now from distributors. And uh, just just launched in like the last month. Uh, and if you're wondering, I didn't know Microchip made uh, FPGAs. This is actually formerly MicroSemi, which is now a division of Microchip. And the dev board to go along with this is called the Icicle. Uh, it's available for, for, for $500 on crowd supply, um, and it's shipping now to the people that backed it back in, uh, that, that signed up for the pre-order back in July. And soon it'll be, able from, it'll be available from the normal distributors, DigiKey and Mauser and such. Um, the specific variant they chose for this dev board, the, the RIS-5 cores are clocked at 600 megahertz, and it has the larger FPGA um, variant, so it's possible we'll see cheaper boards in the future that are built around the smaller FPGA um, parts in, the, in this family. Uh, it has two gigabytes of RAM on it, um, and eight gigabytes of EM EMMC to have uh, Linux already installed on it. In fact, I got uh, a, a preview of one, and it comes with um, open embedded based uh, Linux already set up and booting on it, which is which is quite fun to see. So you know maybe you don't have five hundred dollars. It's not just not in your budget, right? Um, so the Kendrite K two ten is quite interesting. Uh, a low cost processor. It's a four hundred megahertz dual core, sixty four bit RISC five system on chip. It has eight megabytes of SRAM, which is a lot of SRAM, but unfortunately it doesn't have a DRAM interface. Um, there's affordable dev boards available from Cypede, such as the one I'm holding here, which is the Cypede uh, Max Bit, uh, which is only $13, which is, which is quite nice. Uh, full support's been added in Linux 5.8 for it. Um, this was based on work that um, some people like Damien Lamal and Christoph Helvig had done. Uh, the trick here was to get it to run in such a constrained system. 
Uh, Sean Anderson has support now in U-Boot upstream for two of the boards. And build routes used to construct a rootfs for it um, that has um, BusyBox. Um, that was done by Damien. Uh, it's in the process of upstreaming on the mailing list. And there's a great tutorial from CNX Software that takes you through all the steps you need to do to, to build the kernel and build the rootfs and load it up onto the board. Um, but it's only eight megabytes. So it does run out pretty quickly. Unfortunately, there so there is an MMU, an MMU in this SOC, but unfortunately it's for an earlier draft spec that is not supported by Linux, which basically means we have to run as MMU lists. Um, the downside here is that that means for user space, there's no shared libraries, uh, which means that we, we don't really have much space to do anything practical because we have to have Every process has to have copies of, of the library separately. The solution to that is something called FDPIC, and this is what's used for MMU lists on ARM microcontrollers that can run Linux. Um, and a person at Western Digital is working on this. Um, but it's, it's a relatively constrained system. But if you're interested in, in playing around and getting familiar with RISC-V on Linux, you know, for $13, I think it's, it's a, something to check out. And, and you, can, you can do a lot with it for, for not a lot of money. Uh, in terms of exploring like open SBI and the kernel and in the libraries and tool chains and things like that. Here's me uh, a few months ago running what, what was at the time mainline Linux on the the Cypede Mex bit board there with the KT10. So, you know, you're not gonna you're not gonna throw out your Raspberry Pi or your BeagleBone, but I think it's an interesting thing to experiment with if if you're interested with Linux and RISC five. There's something maybe more practical that's going to be coming up is a project called Pico Rio, and this comes out of an organization called Rios Lab, based in China. That's a collaboration between a university there and Berkeley, and their goal is to create a low-cost Linux-capable RISC V platform. And this was introduced back in September at the RISC V Global Summit, and they have three phases planned. The first play, the first phase of the Pico Rio board is to have some samples available by the end of this year. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Um, I think uh, myself and others were quite excited when they announced this at the Global Summit. So um, the idea of more affordable boards coming out, I think, is really exciting because, you know, just some people aren't going to be able to afford, um, you know, $500. Um, and we want to get as many people as possible being able to try out Risk Five, and pouring their software to it um, to make the it really become more widespread and, and more common. Sci5 also has plans to announce a RISC-V PC on the 29th. So when you watch this presentation, that's only going to be a couple days from now. Uh, uh, there's going to be tea talks from uh, some of the founders of Sci5, and they'll be speaking more about this. It's based around a new SOC from Sci5, which implements the vector extension. Um, so I think it's the sort of thing that will be able to accelerate inference for AI workloads and things like that. So I don't know what it is yet, but it should be exciting and, and keep tuned for that. Um, though I don't, I suspect it won't necessarily be super low cost, but it, it will be probably pretty significant in terms of the capabilities and power. And then the, the best RISC-V um, chip that I know of um, that's coming soon is from Alibaba. Alibaba has a chip design division called T-Head. And they've created a 16-core, 2.5 gigahertz RISC-V processor. They had an interesting paper that came out during Hot Chips about it. Um, if you if you search for this, you'll you'll find it in Google. Um, and I linked to some other articles about it. Um, there's the current draft of the vector extension that's implemented in it, which means it'll also be able to handle things potentially like AI workloads, doing inference and matrix operations and things like that. Um, this is expected to debut next year um, and also possibly have a dev board as well. But there's not too many options when it comes to like chips for, risk, for running Linux on RISC-V. So one of the alternatives to that is to use an FPGA. So an FPGA is a field, field programmable gate array. So you can think of it as a, a chip that's just a sea of, or an ocean of logic elements that can be re, re, rewired to implement whatever logic we want them to. And if we have enough of them, if we have a big enough FPGA, we can even implement a processor core, or what's called a soft core. Um, if you're new to the idea of FPGAs, a great talk last year from Hack and Day Super Conference was by Dr. Megan Wax of Sci-Fi. I have a link in there. You can check that out. 
So one of the problems with FPGAs, um, like I learned them in school a while back, and you had to use these giant proprietary um, IDE installations from the vendors. And, you know, it, it was took up a lot of space and they weren't necessarily that great pieces of software, maybe Windows specific, um, though that's changed now. But anyways, um, some awesome hackers such as Claire Wolf got together and started making a lot of progress in terms of having open source tool chains that can uh, target these FPGAs. So the first one was a small one called Ice40 from Lattice. And that was part of Project Ice Storm that Claire Wolf uh, led. And that was followed up by a bigger part from Lattice called the ECP5. Um, and that was done with a thing called Project Trellis. However, the majority of the FPGAs in the market and the, the more powerful ones are from Xilinx. So Project X-Ray and SimpleFlow are targeting Xilinx Series 7. And Tim Mansell tells me that this is almost ready for prime time. And you can think of it kind of as GCC for FPGAs. So the idea here that we have, instead of having to use proprietary tools from the FPGA vendors, we have open source tools in that to target the FPGAs. So I want to talk specifically about a project that I was involved in um, with some other people last year. So there's an awesome hardware hacking um, conference every fall, normally. This year it's virtual. Uh, called Hackaday Super Conference, and as be has become tradition at hardware conferences and hacker conferences, is they have the electronic conference badge that you know displays your name or plays games or does interesting things like this. Uh, this past year we had one with the ECP5 FPGA, so that's one of the FPGAs that's supported by an open source tool chain. And for the conference, um, it was running a RISC-V soft core and it had a games engine and you could do all sorts of nifty graphics things with it. But myself and several others were like, well, that's nice, but we want it to run Linux. So me and several other people got together over the course of the weekend of the conference and tried to see if we could get Linux running on it. The first thing we tried was to use the built-in um, uh, SPY uh, SRAM chips that were in there, but that didn't work out very well. But it was a hardware hacking conference, and Jacob Keep Creedon came prepared. Before the conference, he saw the design of the badge and made an add-on board, which is called the cartridge, because it was that Game Boy form factor that gave us 32 megabytes of SD RAM. And this is much better. Like, Linux does not really want, want to run out of SPY-connected SRAM. Like, SD RAM is, is much, much better for that uh, and this is what it looks like when the cartridge is plugged into the back of the badge. And I thought this was quite interesting. Um, also a great follow on Twitter if you're into FPGAs. Uh, is This is what it looks like when you've wired that ocean of gates or logic elements inside the FPGA to represent a RISC-V processor core. Um, so I thought it was just kind of giving, interesting to see the macro level. Of what does it look like when you have all those elements wired up to be a processor core? Um, but in our case, we used Python to do this, which you might be surprised that you would design a system on chip with Python. So Python has advantages over traditional harder description languages like VHDL, which I learned in school a long time ago in Verilog. Many people are already familiar with Python um, versus the syntax of these HDLs. Um, and I think it's fair to say that there's more software developers nowadays than hardware designers. Uh, which means if these tools for chip design are easier for software developers to get into, we can potentially expand the number of people that are doing um, hardware design. So specifically, MeGen is a Python framework that can automate chip design. So it leverages the object-oriented nat nature of Python, and it, it actually produces Verilog code that can be used with existing chip design workflows. So all the other complicated tools that are in the, the flow of getting a design into an FPGA or getting a chip design off to a fab, um, those all typically expect something like Verilog. So we're just doing the the design in MeGen and that produces Verilog. So we don't have to change all of our other tools, but we can design in something that's maybe more powerful for us. There's a great talk by Tim Ansel about how he used MeGen uh, in Python to design hardware for recording conferences. So here's a nice example from a tutorial um, for, on MeGen that shows us uh, a D flip flop, which is a very standard uh, digital electronics concept. And here it is implemented on the left in VHDL. 
and then here it is implemented on write in MeGen. Um, and I think, to me, I think the MeGen example is a little bit more uh, understandable to me. Um, you know, that maybe because I, I do a lot more software development than I do to chip design, but I think for the majority of people, the one on the right is going to be a little bit more approachable, um, which is why I think Python can, can have a lot of utility and, and MeGen can be very useful for getting more people into chip design. On top of that, we use this thing called LightX. This allows us to build a full system on chip that gets loaded into the FPGA. Um, so in addition to MeGen, which allows us to do chip level design in Python, it also adds an ecosystem of cores that give us things like Ethernet controller, DRAM controller, PCI Express controller, SD card, um, video. So all the different um, pieces that you would have in a system on chip design, there's different modules and we can pick and choose the ones that we need for our application. Specifically, how we got Linux loaded onto the ECP5 and the badge actually turned out to be easier than you might think because we leveraged a project called Linux on LightX Risk Vex Risk Five, which is a bit of a mouthful, but Vex Risk Five is a 32-bit open source implementation of a Risk Five core, and it's designed to be FPGA friendly, which means that it, it doesn't it's it's conservative in terms of the resources that are precious in FPGA versus uh, ASIC, uh, and it's written in this higher level language called Spinal HDL, and Linux on LightX. Vex Risk allows us to build an SOC that takes the Vex Risk core and combines it with the LightX modules we need to have a full system. And it also, you know, I'm talking about the Hackaday badge, which probably none of you have, but it does support a large number of FPGAs um, on different dev boards. So some of the really common FPGA dev boards, which maybe you have in a drawer, may already support, um, uh, Light Linux and LightX may already support it. And it's really just as simple as cloning this repo, uh, like running a couple commands and then you can either simulate it on your system which is pretty slow or you can load it into a supported FPGA board and here it is on the badge so the badge the serial port on the badge is hooked up to a terminal emulator on my computer you can see there that the uh, the bit stream has been loaded into the FPGA uh, the kernel has been transferred over booted up on the soft core and we have our terminal prompt here in, in busybox once we got back from the conference, I thought it would be nice to upstream support for this badge. Uh, now, maybe not that useful because, I mean, probably only five people want to do this, but it's a good example of how to add a board to Linux on LightX. To give you a flavor of what it looks like to have like chip level design in Python, um, this is something called the pin constraints file in the MeGen syntax. And then one of the things that was, I thought, a, a nice example of how LightX is powerful is we had an SDRAM chip that wasn't supported yet, but all we had to do was inherit the base class and then just add in the data that was specific to the timings in the data sheet for the SDRAM module. So like that's all we had to add to get this new uh, SDRAM chip supported. However, it took like five minutes to boot up, which was not very much fun. So I opened up an issue and Florent, who goes by Enjoy Digital, Digital as the maintainer, he's really wonderful. And within like an hour, he posted a fix that made it go 10 times faster, which was great. Um, and just to go back to why I think Python can be quite useful for doing like chip level design like this, like this is the diff, which to me, I can look at that and I can see that he changed something in the, the L2 cache. In this instance, um, it was to make it wider so that it would have to access memory less because SDRAM is pretty slow in comparison to DDR, which most of the other boards are using. And then you notice there is a display there and it'd be sad if we weren't using the display. So, Greg Davil, who's an awesome hardware hacker in Australia, he eventually got the LCD working there. So you probably don't have the badge, but there are a couple options when it comes to uh, ECP5 open source dev boards. Uh, one is from a hackerspace in Croatia that launched on Crowd Supply uh, called the ULX 3S, and that's available right now. There's also the Orange Crab by Greg Davil, and I really like this board because it has 120 megs, megabytes of, S, of DDR RAM. So not only is it faster, but it, you also have much more memory, so Linux will run faster on it. Uh, it's also in this neat little uh, small form factor called Feather. Uh, 
But, you know, if you're not familiar with FPGAs or you haven't worked with them in a while, like a big FPGA with the soft core running Linux is probably not the best place to start. So I highly recommend, recommend checking out the FOMU. There's an online workshop for it. Um, it fits inside your SD, uh, your USB port so you can take it everywhere. Uh, and it takes you through the example of blinking LED in MicroPython and then Verilog and then LIDAC. So it's a nice way to get into this whole new world of FPGAs. And if you don't have any hardware, just your computer, you check out Renode. It's a great piece of software from Ant, Ant Micro. It's an open source project, and it can simulate not only the CPU, but peripherals and sensors, and it can even simulate a network of different nodes. And it has profiles for different dev boards. So like, remember I said that the Sci-5 Hi5 Unleash board is, is rare and pretty hard to get and expensive? Well, I don't need it necessarily. I can use Renode, and my laptop suddenly becomes the board, which is pretty awesome. To leave you with, um, here's an interesting concept that I came across. So the idea of a self-hosted trustworthy computer. So Gabriel uh, Samlo at Carnegie Mellon has this concept of, okay, we have these open source FPGA tools, which allows us to build a soft core that goes into an FPGA that can run Linux. And these open source FPGA tools can run inside of Linux. So we can create a system that can build itself, that can bootstrap itself, um, which I thought was quite an interesting concept. Um, definitely check out his talk there about building a more trustable self-hosting computer system. Uh, added in a couple slides here just to tempt you to, to watch the talk. Um, and I think that's about all my time for today. Um, so I'm happy to take questions, which I believe is gonna be in a chat dialogue in this interface and then also we should have a slack set up where we can continue talking hopefully throughout the rest of the conference uh, thank you for joining me and look forward to chatting with you all virtually bye